Now we even launched a project with them to deliver in, in under 10 minutes. So people, it's it's getting used to, wow. to just getting their food when they want it, how they want it. And we are also strengthening all of our operations on the backside of the e-commerce business to be able to deliver on that promise. Hey gang, it's Thursday, June 24th. Camilo, Lena, Mateo and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e-marketer podcast made possible by Vtex. I'm Marcus and today I'm joined by a couple of folks. Let's start by introducing Camilo Reina Ramirez, VP of Marketing at Grupo Exito, a Vtex client. Welcome, Camilo. Hello, Marcus. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sir, for being here. We're also joined by Lena Toledo, a marketing director at that same company. Hey, Lena. Hi, who are you? Very good. Thanks for asking. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're also joined by senior analysts covering Latin America and Spain. It's Mateo Savels. Hi, Marcus. Great to be here. Hey, chap. Thanks for joining. So before we start talking marketing stuff, let's talk about today's fact. There's a reason for the hole in a spaghetti spoon. So if you have uh, if you know what a spaghetti spoon is, it's that like, uh, if you make your fist kind of like a claw, it looks kind of like that. It's like a spoon and it's got little things on it. Tines, they're called apparently, where you use to separate strands of pasta. So it may have a singular hole in the middle. So whilst that hole also helps to drain water when you lift the cooked spaghetti out of the pot, the hole's primary use is to help you measure out spaghetti. So the amount of dry spaghetti that fits through the hole is a single serving. Blew my mind. This whole time, no one taught. Does ever? Did you guys know that? We kind yes. of sell a lot of pasta. Uh, I did <laughs> hear about it, but uh, I think I'm gonna have that stolen from you to get into an Instagram story on our Exito Instagram. I like, yeah, definitely <laughs> take it, Lena. Did you know that? No. Okay, Matteo. I did. As a good Italian should. However, a good <laughs> Italian does not use a single serving. That is not in our vocabulary. We put the whole box in. <laughs> Dangerous amounts of pasta. Yeah, I, I can't believe no one told me. Although, who are we kidding? I've not turned on my oven in seven years since moving to America. Marcus, but that's, that's a good thing because in Colombia, the per capita consumption of pasta is small. So maybe with your oh. thing, just um, we can increase it a little bit. There we go. Let's <laughs> bump that up. Uh, today's topic, the next major challenge for grocery. So we're talking today to uh, a couple of folks, a couple of folks who are joining us from Grupo Exito. So Camilo, I'll start with you. If you want to explain to us uh, who that company is, what do you guys do? Well, Marcus, for all the folks um, in Latin America working for retailer marketing, they might have heard about Grupo Exito. We're the largest mm -hmm. retailer in the country with operations in Argentina and Uruguay, part of the casino group from France. We have five different retail banners, uh, a lot of different private labels, and probably a dozen of adjacent to retail businesses. Okay. And you're the VP of marketing, um, which is pretty self-explanatory, but um, what, what are some of your main projects in the minute, main focuses right now? So there's a couple of different things. One is, is just growing the business for all of the retail banners. All of the retail banners have different type of customer types. Uh, also, I have a marketing team for each one of those brands. The second piece, it's um, just marketing in the digital world, which is rather different than, than just di mm. plain digital marketing. And the third one, currently in Colombia, we're in a situation where, where there's a lot of social protest and, and social discomfort. So keeping the company's reputation and, and, and working on that is, is one of my main goals at the moment. Mm, interesting. Um, yeah, well, hopefully I have time to come to that uh, that one at the end. Uh, Lena, how about you? So you're um, the uh, marketing director uh, on this very team. What are you focusing on at the moment? Yes, we are like focusing all the strategy of media planning and reach the right people with audiences and how we can get like the marketing technologies to automatize all the strategies that we are doing with, with the marketing team, with all the banners. She's like she's like the backbone for all of the for all, yeah. for all the <laughs> banner teams. Okay. You should just say that, Lena. I'm the backbone. Back, I'm backbone the backbone of the company. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's um I like the I, I support all the brands, so it's a good responsibility to know which works in some brands and which other things should work in other brands. So it's a good job for that. Absolutely. 
it's hard not to have a conversation and talk about the pandemic. So let's let's start right on the outset with the pandemic question. So the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of folks were forced to, to prioritize essential things, grocery being a huge beneficiary of that. Uh, how did Grupo Exito respond to this pivot towards online shopping as physical stores closed down and, and the government mandated stay at home orders? All right, so um, it's quite quite interesting. It's not much different to most of the of the world, where stores were closed, people were, were afraid, and e-commerce was collapsed. We had started before, like twenty four months before, um, our digital transformation initiatives towards strengthening our e-commerce logistics and everything. It was collapsed, but we were able to quickly move over and kind of be able to to deliver groceries on time. But after a few crises, obviously because people weren't going out of the of the streets now in Colombia. The grocers weren't closed, so people w- were able to go, but their visits were fewer, as much as twice the size of the basket. Mm-hmm. Yep, Mateo, how how set up were grocers for retailers for the uh, the pivot to online? Because some regions, some countries, they were trying to ramp up their online business well in advance of this, and were well positioned to benefit from this type of a, a horrendous event. But how well positioned was uh, Latin America or Colombia more specifically? I think many retailers. I mean, we do know that ramping up logistical operations has been priority for many big players in the region and in Colombia as well. It's no surprise that you know the faster a company can deliver products to consumer, the better the consumer experience will be. But I don't really think any company was fully prepared just to the extent mm-hmm. of the surge in or- like order volume and just general logistics. And I'd even say in the U.S. too, if we think Amazon, yeah. I couldn't get an Amazon Fresh delivery. For yeah. weeks, you know, and that's in New York City. So, so I don't think really any players were. However, I think other players were better suited to adapt to the situation more rapidly, had the resources to scale, be it with ramping up logistics operation, being able to hire enough people to support those logistics operations to pivot the demand. I think other certain companies were had digital plans on their roadmap and it was just a further acceleration to say, okay, well, other than doing this, I don't know, in Q3, we're going to do this now and let's really pivot and scale. Uh, Let's divert some spending over to these channels. Let's divert, you know, all of our attention to here because this is what people are. And I think those that had digital in mind were much better positioned and the results show even looking, you know, looking at financial reports of many companies, we see you know, it's the first time we've seen triple digit growth, 150, 200 percent. I mean, these are just growth figures that were never seen before. And that just is a, a testament to the simple fact of how e-commerce became such a priority for a lot of companies across every industry you can think of, and most notably within retail. Lena, what role have mobile devices played in online groceries growth in Colombia in the last, say, 12 months? Today, the role of mobile is, the mobile role is fundamental. In, in our case, we get like a huge growth from our apps because it's like the first channel that we have in the interaction from, from mobile. Today, we have between the two apps that we have from two banners that we have are like for three, five million downloads. And in the case of web, it becomes the number one way of searching with almost 80%. So some of the people enter through, through mobile to search some products and then they can buy in desktop, but uh, they use like the mobile for searching. So it's like the first contact w- that we have with clients. It's like the way which we are like in the pocket of the consumers and it's like a huge responsibility. And we get a lot of challenge last year because we need to deliver the best experience and to respond to their needs. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to move very quickly in some changes that we did uh, last year for deliver that kind of, of experience that the clients needs. Are you guys seeing a big difference in shopper behavior on a computer versus on a mobile device? I guess, first of all, we should establish where are most people buying groceries? Is it on their phone or on a computer? In this moment in the computer, we can, because we start like with the apps like two years ago. So we are like in this moment in, in all the, the growth of the apps, but we are um, one of our challenge in this few years uh, uh, ahead. It's to be the apps, be the number one channel of buying groceries uh, to our partners. Okay. Due to the pace that it is growing, that's going to be very quick. Yeah. Really interesting. And so when people are buying on mobile, when they move from buying things on a computer over to a mobile phone, how are their behaviors different? 
The baskets are smaller, but the purchase is more, more recurrent. Okay. And you're seeing a big shift in the types of things people are buying, times of day people are buying, I imagine? Yeah, there's like it, it was all shaped by the time, by the store closures that were mandated by government authorities. So that also impacted the, the timing and the, uh, the days and the hours that customers purchase. And we're mm-hmm. currently analyzing most of those new shopping patterns in order even to shape some store operations. Mm-hmm. How does uh, Grifo Exito see consumers interacting with uh, the online, so phones, computers, and the in-store grocery shopping worlds going forward? H- how do you see folks moving between those two worlds? Just go back one year. For when people were forced to go online, it was pretty much they were scared of going out. They needed to shop mobile. The experience at the beginning wasn't good. Then because of the order delays, then afterwards it was all very good. And now that we are wide open because we're, it's, it's weird because we're on the, the maximum daily cases and maximum deaths on the whole history, but we're wide open. Uh, so what we wow. see is people going to the stores to buy the larger baskets and then just replenishing online. But the customer, that, that omni-channel customer that goes both to the store and to all of the digital properties is way much more profitable for us. And their loyalty mm. also, it's, it's much better. The, the amount of categories that they purchase from us is larger. Hmm. And is that consumer, uh, how are they looking at a company like Group Exito? Do they see it as, oh, th- now I'm in the online world, now I'm in the, the, the physical world. How are they deciding where to shop? We, we firmly believe that people is, is just loyal to their own needs. So basically, we're trying to provide the best experience in any channel to be seamless and for the people to just know that they're purchasing from Exito, whether it's online or if it's offline, it's just the same, the same brand that they know and trust. Mm-hmm. And we don't have like, digi- we don't think that we have like digital consumers and the ones of Instagram, or they are like one consumer that choose the channel based in here in their needs. Right. And how are you guys doing that? What's the, what's the best way that you found to show consumers that we're everywhere? Whenever you want to shop, we're here for you. So there's, there's a couple of different things. One is that we have store locations which are close to the people. Also, we deliver from those stores. So our groceries lead time is very short. We also have a very good alliance with the, the largest last miler here in the country, which is called Rappi. Now mm-hmm. we even launched a project with them to deliver in, in under 10 minutes. So, so people, it's, it's getting used to, wow. to just getting their food when they want it, how they want it. And we are also strengthening all of our operations on the backside of the e-commerce business to be able to deliver on that promise. Groceries in under 10 minutes. Is, is that like an exceptionally fast time or is that, that, is that like a standard in Colombia? Because that seems pretty fast. It's pretty fast. Um, okay. <laughs> we're actually just in two cities, the, the two larger ones, the, the capital and the second larger city. But we, have, we are seeing a lot of momentum there. Okay, interesting. And how about click and collect? What's the adoption like in, in Colombia or Latin America at large? So click and collect, it's um, a very good way of it being even closer, to be honest. During the pandemic, we were able to launch a 400 different store to stores, WhatsApp numbers. So WhatsApp chats with the same store so people could just order in, on the chat and go to the store. And now we transition that to a chatbot. Where it's it's going to give us a lot more control. And it's going to give the customers a lot of different other options. It is growing at a really high pace. We are aiming a lot and working and putting a lot of effort in the click and collect because for customers it's very well. And for financial of the company, it's even better. Uh, final question here. What does the company Group X do? What, what do you view as the next major challenge in the grocery space? So speed is one. I think people is going to just get more used to getting things faster. So that's one. Two, having all of the available products that people buy, because obviously the, like it ranges from one store to the other, or even we have a, a now some dark stores as well. So having the, the correct assortment for the area, that's another challenge. Uh, and the other one is just tackling with the mobile space on and the different mobile channels that could be open. So there's the app, there's the mobile website, there's the WhatsApp chat, and you know what else is going to come in, but we are preparing ourselves in the tech and logistics side to be able to deliver a large amount of uh, orders from that coming from digital channels. And Lena, does any one of those jump out to you or another challenge uh, top of mind for you perhaps? 
No, it's more like for the marketing role to optimize and to get like the right uh, right audiences to deliver all the things that Camilo is saying like minutes ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mateo, how about you? What, what do you see as a major challenge in grocery for the, for the region? I echo similar sentiments that Camilo and Luna had mentioned. I, I think speed and delivery, I think that's going to be a key point. Also, I'd follow that up with maybe reverse logistics if there's something wrong with the order or just the general continuation of optimizing the customer experience because, you know, you, this company spends so much time and money getting those consumers into the virtual door, but that doesn't stop just at checkout. It also continues on afterwards. So I think that continuation of ensuring the post sale and if needed reverse logistics to help facilitate that, you know, or facilitate any issues post sale. And yeah, that, I mean, that's, like I said, similar sentiments to these two. Mm-hmm. Groceries in 10 minutes. I'm moving to Colombia. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's so far. I can't cook any food. I'm kidding. There's no point for me to order groceries. We have prepared as well. We have prepared oh, food. Fair enough. I'm coming. It's decided. I'll be there soon. <laughs> We're giving you options, man. Come here. <laughs> I appreciate it. I need them. Thank you so much for joining us today, folks. Uh, thank you to Camilo. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Marcus and all. And Matteo, thank you as well. Thank you, Marcus. Always a pleasure. Of course, sir. And now it's time for our uh, quick word from our sponsor, and then we'll be right back with In Other News in the second half of the show. Retail's next competitive threat may come from a business model or channel that didn't even exist a few months ago. This modern dynamic requires companies to adapt quickly, pivoting business seemingly overnight, something traditional commerce platforms just can't support. There's a new enterprise commerce platform on the rise, one that's fast, flexible, and doesn't require nine months and a million dollars to get up and running. Go to vtexvtex.com slash emarketer to learn more. All right, folks, for In Other News, we are joined today by our senior analyst covering global trends. It's Jasmine Emberg. Hey, Marcus. Hey, everyone. Hello there. Thanks so much for taking some time to join us for the second half. Today in Other News, marketers' social strategies, why Facebook is insisting on creating an Instagram for kids, and Reels now has ads. Story one. Nine out of 10 marketers think their social strategy positively influences their bottom line, but less than two in 10 use social data to measure ROI and one in 10 use it to inform business decisions, notes a recent survey from Sprout Social. It also found that close to nine in 10 folks will buy from brands they follow, choose them over a competitor and buy more of them close to nine and 10, will do all those things. And secondly, TikTok has become one of the top five platforms consumers use to follow brands. But just one in three marketers, one out of three currently leverage the platform. Jasmine, which of these numbers jumps out to you and why? So my initial reaction to these numbers and the rest of the ones that were in the article is that none of the results are Mm. really all that surprising, but they do confirm a lot of the trends that we've seen in the social market over the past couple of years. There was one other one that really stood out to me, which was about customer service about how consumers are really looking at social media channels as a customer service channel, but marketers aren't prioritizing it. And that's the one that really jumped out to me. We're seeing a lot more people just get used to using alternative channels to talk to brands. And I'll actually be covering this in a report later in the summer, focusing specifically on messaging apps. So that's why I was so interested in that one. Mm, What's the report called? It doesn't have a title yet, but it'll be Global Mobile Messaging and Use Cases for Brands. Coming to you end of the summer. Pro users, check it out. Story two. Attorneys general for 44 states and jurisdictions called on Facebook to halt plans to create a version of Instagram for young children, citing concerns over mental and emotional well-being, exposure to online predators and cyberbullying, writes Cecilia Kang of the New York Times. Facebook announced Instagram for kids in late March, positioning it as a safer option for children under 13 who already use regular Instagram. Instagram currently has a minimum age requirement of 13 to use its products as federal children's privacy rules state that the company must get parents permission to collect data on these younger users. Facebook stresses that it won't show ads on the app. Jasmine, why would Facebook, who owns Instagram, risk the scrutiny of an Instagram kids service? And can you envisage uh, a social network for children ever being successful? So let's read between the lines here. We all know that Facebook has an age problem and now Instagram is starting to have one too. We just released a forecast Mm -hmm. that shows that more Gen Z consumers in the US are going to use TikTok than Instagram this year. So building an Instagram for kids, in my opinion, 
is Facebook's attempt at attracting younger generations to its services in the hopes that they'll grow up with them. Now, is it a good idea? I'd say probably not. Um, even if it doesn't have ads now, it's it's Facebook. They'll want to find a way to monetize it at some point, and that's going to irk a lot of people even more than they're already irked right now. Yeah, Facebook says that there, there are 7 million monthly active accounts on its Messenger Kids service. 7 million. Um, story three. Instagram's TikTok-esque service Reels now has ads. Less than a year since launching, as Jacob Kastronakis of The Verge notes, the ads will look just like any other Reel, full screen, looping, up to 30 seconds long, appearing in between other clips and identified by a small sponsored tag below the name of the advertiser's account. Jasmine, your reaction to Instagram Reels getting ads? It's a natural next step. Uh, Facebook's core revenue stream, of course, is their ads business. So it was really only a matter of time before they did this. The speed, as the Verge article mentioned, is surprising, but that also makes sense given how big of a hit Reels has been with influencers as well as with marketers who work with influencers. So I think next up, we'll probably see more influencer integration into these paid advertising options through things like branded content tools, um, which Instagram has already on a lot of its other ad formats. Bloomberg noting that TikTok ads have been so successful, the company plans to charge up to $2 million for a one-day takeover. $2 million for a one-day takeover. <laughs> that seems like Super Bowl ad type money. Uh, that's all we've got time for for this episode. Thank you so much to my guests. Thank you to Jasmine. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you to Camillo, who joined us for the first half. Thanks to everyone listening. See you guys tomorrow for the Behind the Numbers Weekly Listen, the Marcus podcast made possible by VTEX. Mm-hmm.